Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey, and I am your host of Consensus Network, and this is episode number one. So let's start out with some basics here. Like, for example, who am I and why am I podcasting about this stuff? So again, my name is Buck Joffrey. I'm actually a board-certified head and neck surgeon, uh, former cosmetic surgeon as well, but now a full-time entrepreneur, professional investor, and podcaster. So I have another podcast called Wealth Formula podcast, uh, which is really about the stuff that I've been doing up to this point in my career uh, as an entrepreneur and in investing. And my ethos as an investor has always been to invest in what we call real assets, like real estate, precious metals, commodities, businesses, things like that, stuff that did not involve Wall Street and, uh, you know, things that, that really the wealthiest families in the world have been creating wealth on. Uh, for centuries. Now, I will say that two years ago, I would have laughed if you told me that I was going to start a podcast about cryptocurrency called Consensus Network. You know, I'd been hearing about Bitcoin in particular for several years, and I always, well, frankly, I thought it sounded like a big joke. Um, Digital money sounded like a fad, uh, and it didn't sound like something that I should be taking very seriously as a real asset investor. And of course, of course, the mainstream financial figures like Jamie Dimon and Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, all those guys certainly strengthened that conviction that Bitcoin was a joke. I mean, they had some seriously strong negative views on cryptocurrency. But then I realized that people who I knew who are actually really, really smart people uh, were starting to take this whole cryptocurrency blockchain thing pretty seriously. So because of that, I decided to take another look and to take a look this time without judgment. And what I discovered was that the underlying technology behind all of the hype was something called distributed ledger technology, a a technology with the potential to have the same seismic effect on the world as the advent of the Internet itself. And since then, I've been studying this stuff, following the technology and the markets very closely. Now, I should point out that I've been talking about this stuff a little bit on my other podcast, on Wealth Formula Podcast. Um, I wanted to share what I learned, but the problem was that, again, this is stuff that's very different from what I normally talk about, and I really just didn't really want to change the whole podcast and confuse my audience about what I uh, was talking about. But I also realized that if I didn't start talking about this stuff, a lot uh, of people would miss out on, on what may be the greatest opportunity in our lives to participate in this not only this technological movement, but this social movement that is ultimately going to create an enormous amount of wealth for those who recognize its importance early. Obviously, it's already done that, but I think we're still in the infancy. So what is and what will Consensus Network be about? Well, this is uh, my brand. This is my crypto blockchain brand, right? The reason I started it was because I started wanting to learn and consume content uh, in all sorts of ways. And and as a podcaster, I have always uh, enjoyed the podcast medium. It's easier to consume information and learn a lot very quickly. And what I realized pretty quickly in the uh, cryptocurrency space was there wasn't a lot of serious discussions about blockchain and other distributed ledger technologies out there. I mean, certainly there are a couple of really good podcasts. I don't want to pretend there isn't, but I wanted to create a show that approached this topic with emphasis on education for serious investors that maybe, you know, maybe who are not involved with this yet. So I don't want to get too techy. I want to teach what I've learned. I'm certainly no expert but I probably know more than most people who are in their 40s who are used to investing in things like real estate and precious metals and things like that. I also wanted to create a show that was a little bit more serious. You know, a lot of the crypto shows out there are about, quote unquote, Lambos and uh, mooning, you know, and we'll get into some of those terms later. But I, I want to create a show that would allow me to become part of the movement to democratize the knowledge behind the tech and projects that will ultimately change our world. That is the point behind Consensus Network. 
And the way we're going to do this is ultimately, at least the plan for right now, is to have two podcasts per week. One will be content-based, education-based. So it'll be like this, like this first podcast, where we're going to go through some of the basics, the history of what's, uh, what's taken place so far in this world of blockchain, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, all the stuff that you might have heard before. And then build on that education with a series of interviews, et cetera, with experts. That's going to be one of the podcasts every week. The other one will be a podcast focused on what the news of the week is. And this is really important to me because I think this changes so rapidly in the crypto world that initially I was planning to do this as one podcast, but just really doesn't make sense because, you know, we we get this content, we interview really good people you know, weeks ahead of time, and then boom, all of a sudden something interesting and, you know, really uh, big happens in the crypto world, and we can't be three weeks, four weeks behind. So we'll plan on doing um, two shows per week. One will be news-focused. It'll be basically the week in, in crypto. Uh, and then this uh, this format, which will be more educational, which will have a lot of interviews. Anyway, when we come back, we'll get started with the very first um series of this podcast in episode number one of Consensus Network. Now, there isn't much more exciting than cryptocurrency, but there are old-fashioned ways of creating wealth outside of Wall Street that have been used by the wealthiest families in the world for generations. And that's what my other podcast is all about. It's called Wealth Formula Podcast. Now, if you've made a lot of money in crypto and don't know what to do next, this show might actually answer a lot of those questions, too. Again, it's Wealth Formula Podcast with me, Buck Joffrey. Welcome back to Consensus Network. Now, uh, let me point out that I'm also doing this as a screen flow because we are doing this as a video and audio podcast and will be out there on YouTube as well as iTunes and Stitcher and everything else. So let me start out by taking it really basic. What is this whole Bitcoin blockchain thing about? Uh, why is it a big deal? Um, so we're going to talk about some of those things in this first episode. We're also going to give you examples of way this technology will change the world and also where this technology is today and what the current issues around it are that will shape tomorrow. Now, the whole idea behind this new technology and ultimately this asset class began in 2009, and there was a white paper published by a guy known as Satoshi Nakamoto. Now, I say a guy known as Satoshi Nakamoto. The reality is that Satoshi Nakamoto is unknown. We don't know who he is. We don't know if he's one person. We don't know if it's multiple people. There's lots of guesses on who's involved, um, but based on what we do know, it's probably the case that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto is multiple people uh, that came up with this concept of Bitcoin, uh, which was intru- introduced by this white paper. Now, this white paper uh, about Bitcoin was introduced for the purpose of creating a digital currency that would solve the problems of, quote, unquote, double spending without the need for a third-party trusted authority. Now, let's back up and understand the significance of that because how is it that we make digital transactions today? Well, we can use Visa. We might be using PayPal. We might be using the bank. Um, I've used things called escrow.com before where you, you know, they have escrowing sites, et cetera, so that you can make sure that there's, you know, that the payments go through. Bottom line is, there's always a middleman that makes the transaction legitimate. In other words, there's somebody who keeps score, and that middleman is known as the ledger, right? That is what a ledger is. And in this model, there's only one central authority. So why do we need a central authority in the first place? Well, it's because we have to make sure that transactions are recorded and are permanent. We have to make sure that transactions are not corrupted and we have to facilitate the transfer of funds, right? That's what a middleman does. That's what a ledger does. And in this regard, the way we've done it on the internet, 
via PayPal, via Visa, etc., is really no different than an old-fashioned bookkeeper's ledger, right? I mean, that's really what it is. It's not any different, even though we were in this digital world. So what's wrong with having a central authority anyway? Well, there's lots of potential problems. The authority may, for example, charge a lot of fees. For example, Visa might take 2 or 3% or more per, per transaction, may charge you. And, uh, of course, there are some issues even within digital currencies that will get smoothed out over time to make it uh, less expensive. But certainly fees are one. I mean, look, Wall Street, for example, is a third party that facilitates the transaction of the equity markets and the bond markets. And they make trillions of dollars off you through fees simply by trading for you. They are the middleman, right? They are the ledger and that's how they make money. Now, what else could be wrong with having a central authority? Well, a central authority could be corrupt or have the ability to manipulate the market and print money at any time. Just look at the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank. That's what it does. Things, you know, can get manipulated. You can start printing money when there's problems. One of the biggest problems with having a single ledger is if there is only one ledger, the ledger can be hacked. So Bitcoin, right, this paper, this idea that came out from the Nakamoto paper, Bitcoin addresses these problems by using what is known as a distributed ledger, a distributed ledger called a blockchain. A blockchain is just one kind of distributed ledger. And the idea is simple. The idea is that transactions occur within this ecosystem of the blockchain. And they're recorded not by one central authority, but rather thousands of nodes, which are essentially supercomputers around the world, right? So now there's not one authority. There are literally thousands of them. And by doing this, it eliminates the need for a central authority. These records are constantly updated with a copy of every new transaction in the ecosystem, which is the blockchain which is recorded on every node. And furthermore, these transactions are permanent. We call that immutable. That means that once these transactions are on the blockchain, you can't go back and change them, for better or for worse. You cannot go back and change them. You can only add to it with further transactions. And that also adds to one of the great powers of Bitcoin and that it cannot be corrupted. Now, within that, ecosystem, the the ecosystem of the Bitcoin blockchain, only 21 million Bitcoin will ever be produced. And of those coins, they are, of course, then directly transferred from one person to another. There is no middleman. That is the big beauty of this whole thing. And hopefully, if you don't understand the significance of that now, you will as we uh, continue. Now, if transactions can be done directly from one person or one entity to another, or say uh, one person to a company directly, do we even need some of these middlemen anymore? For example, do we need banks anymore? Do we need Wall Street anymore? What are they doing? They're just facilitating transactions, right? Well, Patrick Byrne, uh, who is currently the CEO of Overstock.com, has a project that he is hoping uh, will ultimately replace the concept of Wall Street. It is a uh, essentially a, a market that will uh, produce security tokens. And effectively, uh, if you follow the, you know, the way this would work out, you would be able to have a stock market that would be free of the middleman, free of, of, of the banks. No wonder Jamie Dimon doesn't like this stuff, right? So coins in this situation could literally replace uh, company stocks and therefore you could eliminate the banks. I'm not going to say that that's going to happen right away, but the market makers, the banks are the market makers, right? You don't need them anymore in this model. So what are some other distributed ledger uh, technology applications? What else could you use it for? Again, it's basically anything that has a middleman. See, this is the significance of this because most people who come along to this technology for the first time, 
they hear only about Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is dealing specifically with the issue of currency. It is not really addressing all of the other use cases for a distributed ledger. So anything that has a middleman could potentially be replaced by a distributed ledger. Like what kinds of things? Let's think about that for a second. Well, you know, let's take Uber, for example. Now, people like to talk about Uber all the time, right? Uber is the uh, Uber is what destroyed the taxi business. So whenever you see some sort of disruptive force in um, in 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 uh, in the business world today, sometimes you, people use the word Uber, the Uber of. So you know, Airbnb was sort of the Uber of of um, the hotel business and starting to destroy that business, right? So um, effectively, if you think of Uber uh, being uh, the disruptor of these kinds of formal businesses like taxis, etc. Decentralization, distributed ledger technology, which is essentially just peer-to-peer services, will therefore destroy the model of Uber, right? Because Uber, all Uber did was create a different central authority. It was just you know, you know, it was just not as formal as a taxi company, but it was still a central authority. Well, why do you need that if you can have peer-to-peer services? That is the power of distributed ledger technology. And ultimately, the middleman will be replaced by what is known as a smart contract. Now, I'm going to give you a very, very simple concept to swallow the idea of a smart contract. Because you hear this term all the time in cryptocurrency, and it's it sounds very complicated. And listen, I'm not a programmer. I'm sure it is very complicated to make these things, um, you know, make these things come out the way they need to be. But for those of us who are not programmers, a very simple way to understand the idea of a smart contract is uh, a vending machine. So. A smart contract is basically a vending machine. It's a simple uh, peer-to-peer transaction that does not require a middleman, right? So effectively, you put in your quarters uh, and you push a button. And in return, there's a program there that basically allows, you know, your candy or your, your, your soda to come out and you're done. You didn't need somebody standing around. You didn't need... You didn't need m- anyone really to keep score on that. It was just something that was programmed. That's what a smart contract is, right? Uh, It's just a programmed set of rules that is trustless. You'll hear that word a lot in this world of, of distributed ledger technology. Trustless. It doesn't require that you trust anybody. There's just an algorithm in place. I should also point out that I keep saying distributed ledger technology over and over again instead of blockchain. A lot of people talk about blockchain. But as you'll come to realize, there are more than just blockchain uh, ledgers. And there's some serious projects in the uh, pipeline that I'm a big fan of. And that makes me hyper aware of the idea that these are distributed ledgers, not just blockchain. Blockchain is just one kind. A blockchain is just one kind of distributed ledger. Now, what else could you disrupt with a distributed ledger? Well, what do we use right now for music and and video industries? Well, you might use Spotify or something like that, right? But what if artists can directly license music to consumers, right? I mean, one of the things you hear about all the time is about how artists get, uh, you know, they get they, you, they get upset with some of these changing technologies because they're getting squeezed out. They're get you know they're they're not getting as big a piece of pie because of the companies that are selling this. But what if the artists had a place where they can just sell their music somewhere directly to consumers and therefore remove the middleman? That is certainly a a potential place for an application. Energy consumption. So there's a real, there's a real project out there called uh, Power Ledger, which essentially connects um, consumers of energy with producers of energy. So now, again, goodbye to the electric company, right? Because what are they doing? They are the middleman. So maybe if you don't need them, the power, uh, the, 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 the people who create the energy will make more money, and the people who are consuming the energy will pay less for it, right? Because you've, you've taken all that inefficiency in terms of costs away. 
You can also think of this in terms of the tech world, buying and selling computing power or storage. Uh, there's a there is a um, there's a, a a project out there right now called Storage S T O R J that just does exactly that. That's what they're that's what they're focused on. These are real projects that are being uh, created now. If they're not actually doing the work that they intend to, they are in the process of creating those business models that are ultimately trustless and distributed. Of course, cybersecurity. I mean, you know, we're talking about the whole idea of blockchain and the immutable ledgers and things like that. Um, so the idea here is that data can't be hacked on a decentralized immutable ledger, right? So once it's in the blockchain or once it's on one of these other distributed ledgers, the idea is that it cannot be changed. So that certainly helps with things like cybersecurity, right? Health records, for example, right? Social media. Let's look at Facebook. Now, Facebook, this will be really interesting to watch, even the course of this podcast over the years, because Facebook right now is just a middleman that allows you to create your social network online. And meanwhile, they sell a bu bunch of advertising, which is fine. But the most horrible thing about Facebook, of course, is that we know that they steal your privacy. That is a contract that you make with Facebook. They take your information and they sell it. And that's why they're under so much scrutiny. Now, how Facebook deals with this problem will be really interesting in the world of the distributed ledger. You could see other ways of potentially monetizing for them. And after all, they've already got an enormous, enormous business with a lot of people on it. They should be looking at ways to create value out of distributed ledgers rather than fight it. What else? Well, for those of us uh, in the real estate world, we deal with escrows and title companies all the time. But if you have smart contracts, you wouldn't need that anymore. And then, of course, we mentioned healthcare. Imagine having all of your medical records stored on a blockchain that you control, that can't be hacked, uh, that you can basically just give to the physicians and providers that you want to be able to update your medical record and there's no confusion. Um, you know, their pharmacies could have all those records and that of course would also potentially prevent people from, from, you know, taking farm, uh, medicines in multiple places and trying to get, you know, trying, trying to get illegal drugs as a physician. I know a lot about that too. There are so many applications that what I will tell you is, and this is the reason why I am so excited that I created an entire new podcast on this topic, distributed ledger technology will fundamentally change our lives the same way that the internet did it. And someday, not far in the future, not far at all, I mean literally a couple years from now, distributed ledger technology will be everywhere. And for most people, they won't even realize it happened, right? They, they It's just going to be just like the old internet except for that it'll be the new internet and it'll be a lot safer. It will have a lot more privacy and it will be massively more efficient. So this is why I am such a believer in this technology. And as an investor, I say to myself, doesn't it make sense to have some exposure right? I mean, have some exposure to this technology when you know it's coming. And it really is in its infancy. There's no question in my mind. This is just a beginning. And in that regard, you can still potentially get in early. Now, listen, I was a poor medical student and college student when the dot coms hit, when the Internet hit. And even if I'd really known what was going on, I, you know, I probably wouldn't have you know, invested anyway, because again, people were saying it was a fad. Warren Buffett did not believe in the dot com. So people thought he was right and they stayed away from it. Use common sense here. This is a massive technology. It is going to be reality. Um, but that said, and this goes back to the investor in me, the professional investor in me, like anything else, I believe that it is a very good idea that if you're going to invest in something, get yourself in, involved with it. You need to educate yourself. And that will be the primary focus of this show. 
it will be to allow you to learn and become an intelligent investor uh, should you decide it's right for you. Or you could just simply learn what's going on in tech today uh, that will be your reality tomorrow. This is not going to be a show that's going to be a lot about hype. I really want to make this an interesting show for you, whether you want to invest in it or not. I want to learn with you, and that is going to be my focus. So let me back up on something I said before. So why am I so convinced that this distributed ledger thing is going to be our future? Well, when you look at the technology itself, it's such a no-brainer, right? I mean, it is like... Well, of course, it's massively efficient. This is the way things are going to be in the future. And if you look at the facts, it's where the smartest programmers in Silicon Valley are focused on right now. It's where the venture capital is starting to focus, right? And it's about to go mainstream. Now, why do I say that? Well, I know that the institutional demand is huge and that the only thing keeping this market from exploding is the ease of use. Now, this is not an easy thing to do, right? If you're not a little bit technologically savvy or at least, you know, take a little bit of time to learn how to do it, it's not that easy to buy and store these kinds of digital assets. And that is a major drawback to uh, not only individuals um, who may not be that way, but it's also a major drawback to Wall Street and ins institutional players. Now, Wall Street understands the power of this technology. Now, I'm not a big fan of Wall Street, but understanding that there is literally trillions of dollars waiting to happen, let's understand that Wall Street is creating the infrastructure in the background here. They're doing it quietly while Jamie Dimon continues to say that Bitcoin is a fraud and, and while everybody else is sort of keeping quiet about it. But make no mistake about it, once the highways are created, it will not be an easy thing for the little guy to participate and profit anymore. And, and if you're interested and if this sounds like something you want to do, now is the time to get involved with the movement. And I say movement because this is more than technology. And that's what's so attractive about it. It is the confluence of computer scientists and, and libertarians. And it's a very powerful force that creates not only the technology, but a movement of taking things away from third parties and making it a peer-to-peer -peer world. So I would say learn about it and profit from it if it makes sense to you. Now, if going on this once-in-a-lifetime journey sounds good to you, you're going to love Consensus Network. I am excited about doing it. So I'll tell you right now, make sure you subscribe to this show so that you get updated on all of the new episodes and sign up to our email list on the website at consensusnetwork.io. Do not let this opportunity pass you by. Now, if you decide not to invest, good for you. I am not going to ever recommend that you invest your money in something that you don't want. This is for education. But if you do let it pass you by and you realize one day that you could have made millions of dollars, and if you only knew about it, you're going to kick yourself. But if you knew about it and you did nothing, at least you know you made an, a decision based on what you believed, right? So don't let this opportunity pass you by. Want to buy Bitcoin with your IRA? Don't waste your time on expensive IRA custodians. A strategy called a QRP is as easy as writing a check. Find out how. Text 44222 and type QRP book, that's one word, and get a free book that explains everything. Again, that's 44222 QRP book, one word. It's the easiest way to make Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies part of your retirement. All right, welcome back to Consensus Network. It's Buck Joffrey back here uh, with Stephen Honickman, also uh, part of the Consensus Network team. Um, so ordinarily at this point in the podcast, what we would do is a question answer session with your questions. And what I'd love for you to do is either uh, go ahead over to consensusnetwork.io and uh, find the uh, ask a question uh, buttons. Basically, you'll see something where you can record a question or you can send an email uh, or you can send a, a you know, written question or or also you could email us at info at consensusnetwork 
.io. Remember, it's the .io thing. That's what we do in the crypto world. Again, that is info at consensusnetwork.io. Since we don't have any questions uh, from you as of yet, uh, Stephen has uh, you know, written down some of his own questions just based on what we talked about so far in the podcast. So, Stephen, uh, why, don't you, why don't you shoot? Uh, let's do a few questions here just to get warmed up sure. and, and see, uh, see, um, see what we can answer. I guess right off the bat, there were a couple of, of uh, words you used that, that didn't become obvious right off the bat of what they meant. One of them was, was FOMO, and then there was mooning and, and Lambo. What do those mean? Okay, so these are, um, you know, if you're not, if you're new to cryptocurrency and all this world, here's part of the problem that, you know, people are having trouble taking it seriously is because there's so much hype um, around these kinds of, uh, you know, these tokens and coins, et cetera. So um, FOMO is, uh, is the acronym for fear of missing out. So you see that a lot when people are trying to figure out you know, when you see these coins going from, or these tokens going from five cents to five dollars within 24 hours or something like that. So the fear of missing out on that is FOMO. Yeah, you also, along that lines, you have the word mooning, which you mentioned. You see that a lot too. Mooning is uh, more terminology. And it's one of those things where, um, again, you're you're waiting for your token to moon. It means go up to the moon, mm. so skyrocket. And finally, the whole Lambo thing. This is again a uniquely crypto thing, which is kind of funny. Um, it's uh, Lambo is short for Lamborghini. So again, if you make a ton of money in cryptocurrency, uh, you know, Lamborghinis are kind of a shiny new object you could buy with your newfound several hundred thousand dollars. So a lot of times when you go to like Telegram or something like that, and by the way, you can find us on uh, Telegram um, in the Consensus Network. Um, you can find us uh, in Facebook. Uh, under Consensus Network. If you go to Telegram, for example, and, and the crypto people are often there, um, you'll see a lot of these discussions. And, you know, it's sort of a joke. You know, it's like, when moon, when Lambo, just those words. And that's just kind of a, a cheesy thing that's uh, common. And it's, again, it's part of that whole hype thing. But, yeah, that's, we'll talk a lot more terminology in coming shows, but that's that's good you asked. So you mentioned there was a market cap in cryptocurrencies. How could there be a market cap for cryptocurrencies and who establishes it? It's not really establishing. So when we talk about market cap for cryptocurrency, we're talking about, um, we're, re we're really talking about is the total amount of, of, uh, of U.S. dollars in this market. So um, when we say that the market, the market cap is 200 and, and I think what is it, 200, maybe $240 billion or something like that. That means that's all the money that's in all of the tokens that are recorded, coins and tokens that are recorded. And so um, just for, again, for perspective, again, you have now Apple and Amazon, which are both trillion-dollar mm -hmm. companies uh, for market capitalization. So um, each one of those companies uh, is four times the size of the entire cryptocurrency market. Just for reference, it shows you how small this market has, and and you know, and how much upside it, it potentially has. So, so this is still a new market. You've you've mentioned that a couple of times, and and it's good that it's the beginning. Um, I have started to see places that say accepts built accepts Bitcoin. Um, in fact, recently I was at a at a fair, and there was a taco vendor that was accepting Bitcoin, but you don't see that everywhere. How long do you think it'll be before, you know, cryptocurrencies are accepted widely? Well, you know, I think it's a, it's an interesting question because let's talk about Bitcoin in particular, because I mean, Bitcoin, um, was the original, you know, uh, the original digital money for the internet, which was this whole point of the Satoshi, Paper, the big problem with that concept is that Bitcoin, for the most part, um, is it's very slow to transfer. So if you're buying a coffee with Bitcoin and it takes 10 minutes to complete that transaction, it's it's not terribly efficient. It's also pretty expensive uh, for smaller transactions. So um, right now, as it stands, as of today, it may not be the best use. 
But what you're seeing is you, and we'll we'll have hopefully episodes that are talking about this, but you have some of these new um, things coming up called Lightning Network, for example, uh, that are designed to make uh, Bitcoin both efficient and a lot less expensive. So you could have, you know, real-time um, types of transfers and they could be effectively... Uh, you know, no more expensive than using your visa or, or whatever credit card you're using. And I think we're going to see that more and more uh, in the coming days. But, you know, as for other tokens, because you use cryptocurrencies for exchange, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, the whole point behind Litecoin was to create something that you could could move very quickly. You know, I, I, I think there probably will be I'm guessing multiple currencies. And sometimes the way I see this is, you know, eventually we'll have some currencies and it'll almost be sort of like, do you take American Express? Do you take Visa, MasterCard, that kind of thing? Um, and that's kind of the way I think we're going to ultimately see it. But And I don't think it's that far away. I think even within the next, um, you know, next year or two, I think the Lightning Network in particular is going to make this uh, a lot more commonplace. Cool. So as I'm wanting to track things like the spread of, of cur- cryptocurrency and acceptance of Bitcoin, um, I go to Reddit and a lot of sort of technical places like that uh, for information. Where, where do you like to go? So, yeah, and, and I know you're going to ask me these questions and, and put me on the spot to try to remember uh, all the names of things. Listen, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there is a lot of different places um, that you can turn to. Cointelegraph, uh uh, CoinDesk, um, you know, there's uh, just a variety of different places that, you know, Bitcoin News, I'm uh, just, I'm even just looking through my phone right now trying to tell you some of the other ones. But bottom line is, you know, there's a million different places you can get this uh, information. You can also even get some of the, um, you can also get some mainstream uh, news, even from, you know, Forbes and things like that. Although, frankly, I think that most of the time they don't really know what they're talking about. So usually they're just kind of um, approaching it generically and just writing it for the, because people are interested in it. And hopefully this show alone will be a good source of that information. I hope so. Yeah. Great. Well, you know, I think... Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a pretty good start. This is the kind of thing we'll do, um, and we'll have these questions answered, but they will be from you. So make sure, again, to uh, uh, shoot those questions over to us at uh, info at consensusnetwork.io or go to consensusnetwork.io and uh, you know leave your uh, voice or your written questions there, and we will make sure that we answer them on every single show that comes up. Um, also, the show, of course, is now going to be split in, uh, into, well, it's not split, but there's two shows per week. One is the news of, of, the, of the week, and then there's these more informational shows. So make sure to catch up on that. Join anything to get on the list, because that's where I'm also going to send out a lot of these news updates so that if you don't get to the actual podcast, you can check it out there as well. And of course, finally, there is the tutorials. The tutorials are done uh, very well. They're done by Phil Chan uh, of uh, our team, and he's uh, really good at explaining stuff. Uh, go grab yourself, uh, you know, ten dollars of of Bitcoin uh, in the coin by signing up for Coinbase, for example. Anyway, that is it for us here uh, at Consensus Network. I hope you enjoyed the first episode, and I will uh, see you later. See ya.